Aren't you glad I'm not running tech for you? I am not technically oriented, no. no. Usually <laughs> and I don't have anybody at the school. The tech guy has never showed up in the, in the like, half a dozen phone calls I've ever made. He just went, oh, it seems like everything's going okay. <laughs> uh, before I got to class, he was like, first day, I will be there because I know you need this. And I've never seen him since. <laughs> um, anyway, this is Jack Perez. He's the director. Uh, he, he is a, a great guy, done a bunch of marvelous movies and things that uh, I enjoy and uh, he did the pilot to Hercules with uh, our buddy Kevin and and uh, and stuff so I, I want you to talk a little bit about how you uh, broke into the business because that was one of the questions that I got I got sent um, and this is the class behind me raise your hands class if it's okay to videotape you you can't see everybody because they're sitting in a U and I'm blocking some of them and uh, but um, uh, one of the questions was, was how did you go from not in the film business to, or how did, how did you make your path as a director happen? Right, right, right. Well, one thing I just wanted to say is that occasionally I'm going to be drinking from this, which is, I mean, I'm, I don't, this is not my house, this is a hotel. I'm actually up in San Francisco, and um, the hotel provides this water in the, in the form of, it looks like a... <laughs> You know, it looks like gin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or baby oil. Mm -hmm. And I think they're being cute by, by, by putting it in this shape container, but it's, it's water. Just so you know. I mean, I am embittered. And Hollywood is a tough place, but I'm not stupid enough to drink on camera. Um, so, <laughs> any, anyway, um, so the question is, how did you how did you break in? You know, obviously a, a, an important question. I don't know. I, I was so um, myopic in my thinking about what I wanted to do. Um, I just I kept that idea of wanting to be a director in my in the forefront uh, of my mind for so many years that it was just a natural progression. I wasn't going to. I was just looking for any way in. Really, was what it was. But as, I wanted to go in as a director because, for me, everybody who had told me they had come up as a PA. Or that, that wasn't really the route, you know what I mean? It wasn't like you get to be a PA on a movie and then maybe you get promoted to an assistant director and then maybe you get a crack at... Well, it didn't seem to have that sort of stepladder process, even though in the studio days um, there was more of that. So I knew that out of film school I needed to direct a feature. I mean, that was it's like that whole thing. How do you become a feature director? Well, direct a feature. But I knew I had to find a way to direct a low-budget feature to at least um, to at least create the perception that I was a director. No one was gonna people were gonna look at my short films that I made at school, and that's something. But because so many people make short films, the next step I felt had to be taken, which is make a feature because then you will be looked upon as a feature director. So I came out from NYU after graduating from NYU. I had a I had a thesis film or a final film that was like 22 minutes long that won some awards and I had taken a bunch of meetings. I called up, cold called a whole bunch of production companies while I was in New York and I said, hey, my name's Jack Perez, I'm graduating from NYU and I made this film that won Best Director at the NYU Film Festival and I have a horror script and at the time I had a script, a feature script, can I meet with you? And everybody will take a meeting, you know, so I went in and I met with like a dozen or more different production companies. Some were low-level executives at Warner Brothers. Some were some guy in an apartment in his, you know, out in Santa Monica. You know, uh, everybody who who I could get a hold of, and they have, they still have these books that list all the different production companies right. and what they've done. I just looked for production companies that had made horror movies. I figured I should meet all these guys. I met everybody. Nice meetings. Nobody bought the script. Nobody, nobody wanted the script. Nobody. In fact, one woman called and said uh, she was absolutely she was offended by the script. She was like cursing me because how could you write this foul, nasty? I mean, it wasn't that. It wasn't that disgusting. But I, I took that as a sort of a compliment because at least I got a reaction, you know, from the thing. So, so I figured, okay, I still need to move out to LA. You know, I'll move out there and I'll try to get some work while trying to get a feature film off the ground. And I couldn't get hired. 
Uh, I couldn't even get hired to do Xeroxes or pour coffee. I went into Renaissance, Sam Raimi's company, that ended up producing the Xena and Hercules, where I ended up directing. A few years later, I couldn't get a job making copies at, at this place because they said, well, you're kind of, you're a little overqualified for that, and you're a director. What do you want to do be making Xeroxes? And I'm like, I just need to work, you know, and I didn't get hired there. And I looked around. I couldn't find anything. This was a couple of months. And then what happened was that I was introduced to a guy from Wisconsin by somebody else. Somebody said, make a low-budget oh, right, feature. Right. I know a guy who wants to produce one, and he's from Wisconsin. He drives in from, from Wisconsin. He stays in L.A. a couple months, then he goes back to Wisconsin because he can't afford to meet this guy. And I met this guy, and he said, yeah, I've got $7,000 that I want to put. I want to make a movie on my credit cards. Do you want to write in direct? The only caveat is, is that it's got to be an exploitation movie. It's got to be, um, it's got to have the requisite sex and violence. And then he also said, also, and I want to be in it. I want to be one of the leads in it. So that was also the catch. And I said, let me understand you. You're going to pay for a feature film that I'm going to write and direct because I can't pay you. I said, fuck it. I'll take it. You know, because that to me was the, the direct line to being perceived to look, being looked at as a, as a feature film director. So I did it. So I, I packed up my shit, and I went to Wisconsin, where he sort of had rule of the town, which was great for a low-budget movie, because he could blow shit up, and his father was like uh, the ex-sheriff, and everybody was like, yeah, well, everything free, and uh, we ended up making this movie that, that ended up being my first feature film. And I was able to come back to L.A. with this film that made a little bit of noise, and I had that much more cred. And that got me a job at a production company making behind the scenes documentaries, which was sort of a, it was an interesting production company called ZM Productions. It ended up making this great, great documentary. When I got there, they were finishing Hearts of Darkness. Which if you haven't seen Hearts of Darkness, maybe Rex has talked about it. Hearts of I Darkness is by far done the best documentary on filmmaking. It's about the making of Apocalypse Man. It's a feature. Feature documentary on the making of Apocalypse Now, but it's the most candid, uh, insightful look at what it is to question yourself as a filmmaker and think you're fucking up. And Francis Coppola is going crazy, thinking he's blowing this movie. And um, and that company made a whole bunch of behind-the-scenes documentaries, which at the time was pretty rare. It wasn't this was pre? This was just on the on the edge of like laser discs before DVDs had, a, had you know had come out, and there were a million behind-the-scenes. And I ended up getting a job with a lot of young directors making these these short behind the scenes documentaries focusing on a whole bunch of feature films and different aspects. And, and over like five years, I did the making of The Flintstones and Grumpy Old Men and Species and Carlito's Way and, uh, and um, Dazed and Confused and John Woo's first American film, Hard Target. I was on all these sets watching all these directors work, getting paid to make these pieces, and at the same time working with a writer friend of mine developing the next feature. And um, I know this is a laborious thing, but they, or a circuitous thing, but, but, but the last thing I'll say is one of the behind the scenes pieces I made was for John Wu. This lousy movie that he made, his first American movie called Hard Tarts, with Jean Claude Van Damme. But I was a big Hong Kong action fan, and I knew all about John Woo from his Hong Kong movies, The Killer and Hard Boiled and, um, and Bullet to the Head uh, and so forth. And, um, or Bullet in the Head, rather. And I said, I can make this documentary. And I made this glorious profile of John Woo, making him like the second coming of action directors. Sam Raimi and Rob Tapper were the producers of that movie. And so when they looked at the behind the scenes piece, they were overjoyed because it's going to promote the hell out of their new movie. And they looked at how I was editing that piece and my love of action, and they said, hey, what have you done? And I said, well, I, was, I did this low budget feature. And they looked at that and they said, well, shit, you know, we're doing this new show Hercules in New Zealand with Kevin Sorbo. How would you like to direct the, act, the second unit, the action sequence? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And that led to that. And then off of that, I did a good job on that. They offered me the pilot to Zenith, Warrior Princess. 
And so it was this weird thing where I couldn't have, I couldn't have strategically decided to do behind the scenes documentaries or second unit on a, on a Hercules show with a pilot for a TV show, but I did it all really in the service of this bigger idea, which is that I, I need to be a feature director, I need to find a way. And so my whole career from that point on, 20, 23, four years later, has been about uh, doing whatever I can as a director uh, financially to subsidize my what is essentially an independent film career. And so I've had the good fortune of being able to now bop back and forth between studio projects and TV projects, film projects, and then also do um, the smaller independent movies that I love. Um, and I love it all, but I think when I look back at the, my career, there are like four movies that I, um, I take real personal pride in. The other ones have aspects of myself that are essentially works for hire. And that's what I've, you know, that's what I've, that's what I've done. But that's how I got in. And it's, it's not like, well, you go and you do this. It's, it's, I think you have to have an attitude and a survivalist attitude, and also a very fixed idea of what you want to do in the business. And if that changes, that's fine. I mean, you may go in saying, I want to be a GP uh, or, or, or a director, and you find that you're more of a cinematographer, you're more of an editor, and wherever your love takes you is, is absolutely fine. But I think you need <coughs> sort of a crusader's attitude, because that's the only thing that's going to push you through the, the amount of rejection that you face, which is no, you, you, we, don't, we don't think you're qualified to pour coffee, sorry. Yeah. Are you qualified to pour coffee? I, I think I'm marginally, marginally qualified. Sometimes I miss the time. You're overqualified to pour coffee. Well, I mean, that's, that's a sad fact. I mean, people will say, you're too, well, you said I wanted to work, and they go, yeah. but you're too qualified. Yeah, I, I mean, look, it, it goes back, it goes back, it goes back and forth. I mean, there, there are things where, like, I did the sequel to Wild, I did this, there was a movie called Wild Things that Sony made. I made the, the sequel, Wild Things 2. I got the job to do Wild Things 2 because of an independent feature that I had made previously, and somebody recommended me, and I got this job. And I would never have decided in my heart, I'm going to make the sequel to Wild Things. I didn't love the first movie enough to, like, I, I can't wait to make the sequel but it was an opportunity to make a three and a half million dollar thriller, and I knew I could do something with it, and I did it. And then, you know, I felt pretty good. I felt I had more options at this point. I had a few features under my belt, and they said, "Well, can you do Wild Things 3? And I was like, you know, and they were saying, "We're not going to pay any more money, even though Wild Things 2 was a big success and enabled them to make Wild Things 3." And I was like, "Yeah, you know." And I started to get this, not an attitude, but I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. I'm not going to get paid any more money, and and I don't, I asked maybe, can I, I don't want to put my name on it, you know, like I'll just use a pseudonym, and they were offended by that. Oh, you know, why wouldn't you put your name on something as glorious as Wild Things 3? And I turned it down. And then, you know, a couple of months later, I was completely out of work, and I was like, I would have been begging for a while. I was like, give me porn, I'll do anything, you know, I'll do anything. So. So there's a there's always this back and forth. There's never been as much as I've wanted it to be this kind of thing where you attain a certain level and then you stay there. That, you know, I'm sure Rex has mentioned this. It's like the business is the cliche, it's peaks and valleys. It's like you'll do something and you'll have money and it'll work and everything, and then all of a sudden the, the bottom will drop out again. So I think what I was saying earlier about having a, um, a thick skin, but more importantly, a vision of where you're going is the thing that sees you through the, the lower depths, you know, which, which can be frequent. You know, it's just a fact of life. It's just the way it is, you know. Awesome. No, I, I, I appreciate you uh, describing that path. Would you like to mention the four films that, that you uh, have taken pride in? Yeah, sure. And I think it's funny because the, those films, with a few exceptions, are not as well known as the ones that I consider the works for hire. I mean, I always thought that it was funny that my mother knew about the movies that I cared least about. <laughs> those were the ones, she goes, oh, I heard about that. And I was like, no, that's, the, the four films that, uh, let's see, well, are there four films? Yes, there's definitely three films. Uh, one is called The Big Empty, which is a film I made in 1997, which is probably, was my second feature film uh, that 
like that. It was a kind of a revisionist private eye movie, um, very much inspired by Altman's The Long Goodbye and Raymond Chandler, and it's character driven. And there was a film that followed that called La Cucaracha, which was with Eric Roberts, which was a south of the border noir. Uh, again, very character driven, but kind of playing with genre. Um, and then Some Guy Who Kills People from a couple of years ago, which was ostensibly a, you know, a, a horror comedy drama that John Landis produced. Um, I would say probably those three films, and there are definitely others. You know, there are other films that I've made that have big parts of me in it, but I think those three films uh, represent, in my mind, the kind of my, my interest in, in film and what I like to do best with film, which is to take genres. And in this case, one was a private eye movie, one was a, essentially a Western adventure, and the other one was a horror movie, and take genre movies that I love but do something inside of the genre that is more satisfying to me, which is to make them more um, realistic or more character-driven than you would normally expect. Um, and the, those, are, those are the things. So it's a combination of character and atmosphere that I like to explore when I can. Uh, but most movies, you know, most big, the bigger the budget, the more normal the movies become. And I guess my own tastes are slightly more left to center or eccentric not crazy. I mean, certainly not experimental. But normal is not, I'm not that interested in just doing it the same old way. Even though I love tons of movies, I don't want to necessarily make, make that. I want to make something else. My version. Um, I'm going to open up for questions, but I, I want to ask you, the difference between these movies for you and the movies for hire in terms of what you get as a director to bring to the movie. Are, 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 do you have meetings with producers and writers who go, no, 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 that's not how we're going to do it? Or have you had full latitude? What, you know, what are the pros and cons of, of working for someone else versus yourself? Right. Well, I mean, the, the pros of working for someone else is generally you get paid. <laughs> And you get usually you get paid. Not that you don't get necessarily some money when you make a small movie, but you don't make as much money. The cons, I think, definitely outweigh the pros. At least for me, because it, the amount of creative interference that comes when you take somebody else's money, which gives them the power to change at any given moment any aspect of the movie, is a real uh, heartbreaker for me because. If you have a particular, if you're a filmmaker, you have a vision of something, ideally. You have, you, you have a way you want to tell this particular story. You have a way you want to direct it, right? And uh, if somebody comes in and, and starts to monkey with that at, at any given stage, which is in the writing stage, they can say, well, no, that scene, keep, put this line in, take this line out. Uh, it could be in the casting stage. By the way, all these things have happened. If we don't cast this guy, who's exactly what you need to be. Cast this other guy, because he's a friend of mine. But but that's the guy's not as good. No, 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 I'm paying for the movie, you cast this guy. All the way through, generally it doesn't get into shooting because most producers don't know this about the actual production process of why you compose a shot a certain way, or why you have the camera move a certain way, or whatever. But as soon as shooting's over, then the tampering and the editing comes. Cut that, add that, take that out. Um, and it's like little by little you can find the thing that you, even if it's a, even if the things that you did love about this work for hire, even those things could get chipped away by somebody who is able to force you to do that. And I feel that unless you're a hack, and I've said, I said this the other day to somebody, I said, in a way I wish I was a hack. You know, it's almost like ignorance is bliss. You wish you were Forrest Gump, you know. You wish you didn't care, because if you didn't care, then when they come in and monkey with it, then you're like, all right, whatever, you know, I don't care. I, guess. I like calling action and cut, it's fun. I mean, if, in a way, if, if, you do, if you're that kind of director, then you're going to take less um, emotional, um, you're, not, you're going to receive less emotional damage than if you're somebody who has a very clear vision, because um, chances are, unless you're working with people who think exactly like you, and usually they don't, they will uh, piss on it, as they say. 
So uh, I prefer the smaller budgeted movies where I have way more control because ultimately what I have in my head gets on the screen and that's the reason why I do it. It's not for the money because there are, uh, you know, again, the cliche is true, there's easier ways to make money. Um, and so that's, that's, my, that's just my thinking on it. I think when I was younger, when I was in film school, I just wanted to make a movie. You know, when I was in film school, Oh, no. There we go. Jack? Hang on. It, w w you froze. It, it froze. It said, when I was in film school, and then it... Oh, I was just going to say, how about now? Is it all right? Now it seems to be... It's verging on okay. Yeah. I think it's okay now. Is it all right? Go ahead. I was just saying when I was in film school, I was less discriminating. I just wanted to make a movie. I didn't care what it was, so I didn't care. But when I went, but as the years went by, and as I did get the opportunity to make movies, both independent and those guy, you know, bigger financial forces that tended to be uh, interfering, it became more important to me to make a movie that uh, I care about. On a smaller budget, if possible, just so that I would have more creative control. Creative control, to me, is the best thing you can have as an, any kind of um, artist, creative person. You know, otherwise, it's not your movie; it's somebody else's movie. You know. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my take on that. Fair enough. I got other questions, but I want to open it up for city questions from the. Um, you had said that the. Uh, um, that the, the, the bigger the budget becomes, the more normal the movie becomes. Does, do you think that has more to do with the fact that there are so many more hands in that pie, or the fact that you have to appeal to the lowest common denominator to kind of make your money back? I think it's both. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I think it's both. I think that, like, um, it's like McDonald's in a way, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're making that appeals to them. I'm sorry, I, it's sort of. Uh, Feedback or something. Yeah, there's it's, it's something weird that's going on, and I'm not sure what it is. How about now? Can you hear me? Is it all right? We hear you fine. Every once in a while, there's a stagger or something. I think what happened at the at the college there was like a, I didn't see the lights go off, but my phone uh, dinged for charging at the same time that you froze. So there might have been a power issue. Oh, all right. Well, whatever you have to do. No, I mean, in answer to your question, which is a good question, I just think that. They're trying to appeal to the lowest common denominator because the more people that go, the more money they make. And so, for whatever reason, people are more, um, you know, there's a reason why there are shows like uh, Two and a Half Men, you know. There are a reason why there are America's Funniest Home Videos. I mean, the, for whatever reason, base, uh, base entertainment is more accessible. And uh, and that's a real shame because what happens is, is that unless you unless those are your personal tastes, that's what you're going to be pointed towards in the creation of a larger picture. And there are there are, there are exceptions. You know, there are exceptions where where something more individual does come out of the studio system. But as time has passed, those those films are fewer and fewer. Which is why every filmmaker bemoans the '70s or the loss of the '70s or calls it the golden age, because that was a period where the studio was financing independ independently-minded, um, eccentric, comparatively eccentric movies. That idea of getting a big bunch of studio mon money to finance a, a weird movie, that is, is a very rare thing, unless you happen to find some crazy zillionaire who's willing to bankroll you, which is always my, my dream, you know, to find some lunatic who just wants to pay for your vision, but yeah, I think that's the reason why. Also, the people who are also the people that are in positions of power, financial power, are not necessarily creative thinkers. You know what I mean? I mean, the people that are are greenlighting movies for the most part are not artists; they're money men by definition, right? So the person who thinks in that manner is not necessarily going to be open to an idea that is outside of. Um, outside of the norm. They're going to immediately go for a normal idea because that's their own personal taste. 
you know, which is another reason why you hunt for the producer that happens to have, you know, maybe taste closer to your own if you can find it, you know. Um, but that's that's what I think. It, it seems it seems that with the demise of the studio system in the late 50s, early 60s, that the corporation swooped in and it became a, a land of lawyers and bean counters and accountants and, and the executive decisions are not being made. I mean, while the bottom line for the studios was was profit, it's always been, you know, money-driven. There was, you know, you had Louis B. Mayer or Sam Goldwyn or the Warner Brothers, you know, you had the Lemley, you had personal names on the studios uh, where people would take pride in their work and they were you know, a certain number of staff, and the decisions were all in-house. Now it's these corporate committee decisions and and right. nothing to do with filmmaking. It has everything to do with everything else, like like right. making a pair of shoes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, uh, and in the case of the 70s, if you've ever read the book Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, which is a great, a great account, and there's a documentary, Easy, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, about that period, it's because the studios were failing. You know, this was this is coming into the mid to late 60s. No, the studios weren't making any money anymore. And it was almost like, well, what do we do? And the example is 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 um, Dennis Hopper's movie Easy Rider, which was made on a low, ultra low budget, made it kajillion dollars. And so the studios were. It wasn't about like, well, we we suddenly our minds have opened to this crazy druggy. Like we're all like you, man. Like we want to make Dennis Hopper movies. It was really just, fuck. This little movie made a kajillion dollars, and he obviously knows what the people want. Let's let in all these basically hippie directors with their crazy ideas. Maybe they'll make this a kajillion dollars. So it was definitely driven by money and desperation. But what had happened was when, when those movies started to make money, more of those movies got made. And so it's also contextual. It's also the, there was a time in the 70s, late 60s through the, through the late 70s where people wanted that kind of entertainment. And until people want, until the masses want something else, uh, even if they do want something else, I think that's the shame. I think a lot of people do want something else. Well, do you, like, let me ask you this. Do you think that today the reason why we see the blockbusters is because they can do it and we can't? We can do everything else. I mean, we can take our phones and make movies and edit, and we can grassroots distribute, but we can't make blockbuster tentpole uh, $300 million movies, so they can, and that's what separates them. That keeps them in business yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that's definitely a part of it. Also, I think that the perception of what a movie is has changed. I mean, historically, you know, since the dawn of cinema, you know, over 100 years ago, the original the original concept for film was it was a gimmick. I mean, it was yeah. a gimmick. It wasn't art. It was like, you would come into this tent and see this magic trick, which is moving pictures, right? And it was only over uh, much experimentation as the business and the art form developed that people were like, oh no, you can actually tell stories with this and it's not just a train pulling into a station or a guy, right. two people boxing. And then it can be art and it can be poetry and then it's like the cyclical thing where it kind of like came or it came from being a gimmick to this incredible art form and now it's like back to a gimmick, you right. know, in, in a way where, you know, movies used to, and, he, and here it was like, movies are like an amusement park, right? Now with 4D, music movies are awry. It's not even it's not even an abstraction. It is in the going in the direction of a ride. So you're right. If 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 independent filmmakers with um, smaller budgets can make things that are uh, more character driven and more intimate and more personal, then the studio can only make uh, this other thing that we don't have, which is the hundred gajillion dollar thing. You know. Um, I mean, there are obviously variations, and it's a, sure. it's, it's a very easy thing to whine. You know, I think I think filmmakers are like, uh, you know, like GIs in the army. You know, it's like they're they're it's almost their duty to whine, complain about the way things are. Um, but uh, you know, that's you know, I, we talked about this. This is this is that line in uh, in Godfather Two that that Lee Strasberg says. Uh, oh. you, know, you know, this is the business we have chosen. You know, and and it's true. If you choose to go into this business, you know you you. These are the things that happen in this business. You can't go into the mob and then get get upset when somebody shoots your best friend. You're know, like, well, this is this is what happens. You know, it's just so. I love it. I love it. 
This is the business we've chosen. All right, any other questions? I got a question. Yes. Um, now, the first question was asked by Ryan. Who is this? Uh, Kevin. Kevin. Uh, you mentioned that the, the, the work is kind of like peaks and valleys. What do you do during the, the valleys to keep above water, you know? Uh, anything I can, really. Um, I have uh, I've done reality shows. I've directed reality shows to stay uh, afloat. You know, anonymously. Now it doesn't matter because everybody does anything which puts their name on it. But in those days, I I, uh, I did reality shows. I used my cat's names, you know, in the credits. Uh, I've cut trailers. I've uh, I went back and did behind the scenes documentaries. Um, uh, anything I did second unit again. Um, anything that would enable me to keep my hand in the process. You know, and I don't even think that's necessarily, I don't think that's necessary. I mean, I think there, I know plenty of people who do anything for money while they prep the next thing, and I think that's perfectly valid. And, and, and for me, I felt like I had a skill, I had developed skills as a cinematographer, as a, as a director, as an editor, that I could apply uh, in different places to, to make money. So that's what I ended up doing, you know, and, um, and so that's how, that's how I stay afloat, you know. Um, but I, I think it's really anything, you know, it's like you, you can do anything in the service of your art or that, that's, that's fine. That's good. But if it's inside the industry, it's better because at least you feel like you're, you're, you're applying what you, what you, what you learn, you know, in, in school. Cool. Um, I want to ask you about some guy who kills people, uh, cause you know, I have a, <coughs> uh, I love that movie. Thanks. And uh, that also, you know, you're going to end up back in Wisconsin making a movie because that's, uh, er, is it Eric Prince, Price? Uh, oh, Eric Price, yeah. Eric Price is from, from here. He was part of um, uh, the improv group. The uh, They're on Water Street. What the heck is their name? Um, huh? I didn't know that. I didn't know Eric was from, from, from where you guys are. Comedy sports. Yeah, he is. He, he, he was here. He did another movie with a friend of mine, um, uh, Pete Schwaba, who oh, okay. directed a movie called Godfather from Green Bay. Oh, cool. And uh, he came back, and, uh, and Eric got a part in that. And then Eric moved to L.A. You know, he was, yeah. he was a he was a up-and-coming star in the comedy sports here. And he moved to L.A., and then he turned up as uh, Barry's... Uh, Right, and he's great. He's great, and he was a, he was a you know he was a, a last minute replacement for an actor that fell out, and uh, uh, and I was really happy because he's terrific. He and is great with Barry. Yeah, yeah, and Barry was wonderful, and Kevin and Karen, and uh, everyone. That was a a wonderful movie. Um, I want to ask you about the the festival run and the, and the and some of the issues with that, and some of, and the success that you know, and and ultimately what happened. I also want to ask you about the CGI. Uh, special effects movies that 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 some of those that you've done. Uh, we, we have people who are interested in animation or oh, cool. special effects here, so you might be able to address some of that. So, could we begin first with the uh, uh, Mega Shark? Uh, Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's funny because again, that was a, somebody asked, "What do you do?" And you know, when you're in the valley, that was a valley for sure. <laughs> I, mean, I had. I had uh, I had been prepping. I had been getting ready to make a movie that I had written, which is still unmade, uh, with a company. I had spent basically a year and a half developing a movie. Not developing, but hustling. Like I, I, this was like 17, 18 years into my career. I realized that maybe I'm maybe there's another way to get a movie made, and I realized that maybe I should try really being a political animal and buddying up with with people who are trying to make movies and get to know them. And just being friends with people is a way of getting things done. And I'm not, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in pretending to be friends and I, I can't do it anyway. I can't fake it. Um, anyway, so I got very close with this production company and this, the head of this company who had the ability to green light a slate of about $5 million movies, and I had a, a film that I wanted to make. I, long story short, a year and a half I spent meeting with this guy at dinners and 
and on the phone with him every day and getting to know this guy, finally my movie was going to get made because he liked me and he liked the project and he felt comfortable. Again, year and a half of, of, of just socializing and pushing my movie until finally it got made. And the second we were casting, it had been greenlit. The company collapsed financially. And all of a sudden, there was no money to make movies anymore. And they called me up, and they were like, sorry, there's no movie. And I hadn't been working in that period because I doing anything else, because all I'd been doing was being political. So this movie was going to be DGA, WGA. I wrote and directed it. It was going to like clear away all the debt and everything. And the movie just evaporated like like a puff of smoke. And I was like, uh, you know, I gotta. They're gonna take. You know, I gotta pay the rent. What am I gonna do? And I got. I called up this low budget production company, the Asylum, that I had done one other movie for, also in a valley. And I said, What do you got? I need. You know. They said, Well, we can pay you. We can pay you five thousand dollars to write and direct a movie if you can write the script in two weeks. And shoot it in 12 days. And I said, fine, I'll take it. What do you got? You know, what do you got? Anything. And they said, and again, like, I know $5,000 is not, is, is, is good money, but in, 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 the, in the world of filmmaking in LA, $5,000 to write and direct a movie is about as low an amount of money as you pot. $2,500 for a feature strip and $2,500 to direct is low, right? It's a low amount of money. Um, and it was in LA, that was going to pay for one month's worth of bills or whatever. So right. I was like, okay, I'll take it because I need it. I don't have anything. He said, well, we've got like a dragon sorcery thing, and then we've also got a shark versus giant shark versus giant squid thing. And I said, I'll take the squid thing because I had grown up on a lot of monster movies, loved monster movies, loved Godzilla, loved the original King Kong, loved all the 50s atomic mutation movies. I said, I'll do it. And so I, that ended up being Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus, which, for whatever reason, ended up reinvigorating um, that particular world. And as a result, like 42,000 shark movies came after that, you know, both low budget and um, low budget and big budget. And, and, um, and Sharknado is made by the same company, and that's a direct result of of that movie. So, uh, again, even on that level, I had a ton of interference, creative interference. Uh, and they fucked that up royally, too, but it didn't matter. It seemed that there were enough crazy things in the movie to um, to stick with audiences, and it was silly enough to, to, to be popular. But but I didn't want to do that. I did it to survive. And, and, and I used what I loved about monster movies and put it into that thing, but it, it, that's how that came about. And and were there, you know, CGI practicals? Uh, what? Well, yeah, it was mm -hmm. both. I mean, I grew up uh, loving practical effects. I grew up in a, you know, my generation loves miniatures because of the original Star Wars, John Dykstra's work and in Star Wars, Greg Jean's work and in, in Close Encounters, um, you know, uh, Ray Harryhausen and stop motion animation. All that stuff was all practical effects. So. I love that stuff, and even when I was doing Hercules and Xena, Sam Raimi was of that generation too, so he loved, so we did a lot of practical effects. Now, it's, I, I propose doing Meg Shark vs. Giant Octopus with like rod puppets and things like that, but ultimately, well, the state of the fairs being what they are, it was a CGI show. So there was 90% there was of it was CGI. Um, done by a production company that does low-budget CGI effects. And there are, you know, there are a lot of, small, just like there are smaller production companies making movies, there are smaller effects houses making, doing effects for those movies. So it's a good place to start. Um, it's a good place to start because, you know, you're going to get paid little, but you're going to get a chance to, to do effects on films. And, um, you know, they did one forced perspective shot, which was a miniature. In Mega Shark, which I love because it's a practical in-camera effect with a miniature whale, an eaten whale on a beach that I did as a forced perspective gag, but but not, most of it was CGI, yeah, and, and most of it is okay. You know, some of it is okay, some of it is terrible. You know, it's one of those things where it's almost like the idea of the effect. If the the idea was was better than the execution, and that's what made it uh, work, I think, if at all. <laughs> Uh, yes, Stephen. It brings me to 
sort of a thing, Stephen. Uh, I was saying, what was the purpose of using a model set and model car for the scene in Monster Island where the white car is overlooking the city? And was the whole movie shot in the studio? Oh, thank you for watching Monster Island. Yeah, most, that, that's... Um, yeah, well, that's see, Monster Island was a was a was a was a movie that I had more control over in terms of the uh, in terms of the direction. So the, the that whole movie was sold on the basis that all of the effects were going to be done practical, uh, that there was going to be no CGI in that movie, um, and and that's what I sold to MTV. I said I want to bring stop motion animation and miniatures back into the. Uh, into into the into, into movies into this movie, and um, so that's why the rest of the movie is all stop motion animation and miniatures. And for whatever reason, that's a really good question because for whatever reason, I felt that the flashback, which is, has nothing to do with monsters, uh, where Mary Elizabeth Winstead is parked in, in the car, for whatever reason, I just decided at that moment to do it as an effect, as a miniature effect, because. I felt it was um, well, not it was practical first of all because I didn't have a uh, I didn't have a clip or I didn't have a view of the city because we were shooting in um, <clears throat> Vancouver. I felt it would just be in the style or the flavor of the rest of the movie. But I admit it's kind of weird. I'm sure, sure play is kind of weird. But it's funny that you mentioned that. No, it was strictly because I wanted to stay faithful to this concept that I was going to use miniatures and uh, and. and I do agree. It's a strange thing, but it's it's just the choice I made. Cool. Any other question? Oh, I I got one. No one else asked. Uh, uh, yeah. Um. So, like, I guess uh, ultimately, um, you, if uh, well, how did you how do you go about like finding? Uh, good funding for like kind of your first independent film because I know like once you make those contacts it becomes a bit easier it's still a pain but at least you know the people you need to talk to like when you're doing your first right. one what what is kind of the modus operandi for that uh, it remains the same right I mean literally right now in the same place where I'm like where do I find the money for my next <laughs> um, I don't think there is a. I don't think there. I mean, I don't think there's a there's a, a clear answer to that because um, you you get the money wherever you can wherever you can find it. I mean, I was lucky enough in the case of this my first film, which by the way is it's funny enough they're, they're releasing they're re-releasing it on, on DVD this year. It's, it's got a crazy title. It's called America's Deadliest Home Video. That was the name. Of it. It's considered the first found footage movie, which is why it's being re-released now. Because I made that back in 1990, 1990, when there wasn't any found footage genre to speak of. Um, and but again, that was a guy that said it was a barter. He was like, "I'm gonna, I, I need to make a movie that I want to act in. I've got seven thousand dollars on credit cards. Uh, you you write and direct for free, and I get to be in it." And that's the deal, you know. That, that and that's that was that weird little setup, you know. Um, uh, in other cases, it's come from just like in the case of the Big Empty, the movie I mentioned. Um, that movie was basically a limited partnership where we created a limited partnership, which was just myself, um, the producer, and the writer, and then we went around looking. Individuals who could each put in ten thousand dollars. It was a hundred and fifty thousand dollar movie, and we hunted around some. The producer who knew some people who had uh, ten thousand dollars to as a tax write-off or whatever, and they decided to. Uh, he decided to pursue those people. It's it's always a, um, a hunt. Mm -hmm. you, know, you never know when it's coming. I do I do think it's easier to find money from people who are not in New York and, or L. A. People. From your local community who happen to have money, who still romanticize the idea of investing in a movie, because in LA and New York, everybody's like tapped out. Everybody's a cynic. Nobody everybody's wants. been asked. Yeah, everybody's been asked. Exactly. I'm just gonna. I think I'm gonna adjust. Got something here. Uh, you, you raise a good point, and and it's funny because as you were talking, I was thinking, 
you know, we're so used to going to the supermarket and picking up our food or driving in and picking up fast food or having it made. Uh, you know, in the older days, you had to get your bow and arrow or your slingshot or something, and you had to go out and hunt for your food. And that's the state of movie making today. Every, every day you go out and you hunt. To yeah, it's, it's, and it's, and it's, and it's, it's a frustrating process, and I don't, and I'm just like pouring coffee. I'm not any good at it. You know, like, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not a money, I'm not good at hustling money. I don't know rich people, and I don't know, I can't tell them, you know, because no, and no one can tell them. No one, no one in their right mind invests in a movie thinking that they're going to make their money back. I mean, in a way, investing in an independent movie has got to be about either they can afford to lose it, or they 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 trade the law, the probable loss of the money for the thrill of being a producer on a movie. Well, you know what? I mean, it, people go to Vegas all the time and lose money and have a great time. Right. So right. it's it, you know you, what you're looking for are those people who want the experience of making a movie, who want to rub elbows, who want to get their family in the film. You know, it's not the person who goes. You know, you better give me, you know, my money plus 25% back or else. Uh, those are the people who you probably will spend a lot of your time uh, meeting with and then never coming through because they don't have the money that they can willingly lose and enjoy it. Right, exactly. I mean, I think that it's a, I wish there was a clearer definition of how you go about it, and there, there, there isn't. I mean, I remember... Um, I, I, my whole life, I've looked for an answer, like a, not, not a mathematical answer, because I'm not a math person. I've looked for a like, what exactly do you need to do? And it doesn't matter who I meet, who who has been successful, or or even in my own experience, there is no, there's no, there's no solution. There's no actual equation except to pursue. You, I hate the experiment, but to pursue your dreams, but pursue what you want to do, and and, and if you're um, and if you have that focus, if you have that focus, that will many times push through doors and see you through to a result, even if you don't, even if you hadn't anticipated that particular. But you have to have. I think you have to be a crusader. Um, you have to be a crusader, otherwise, every time somebody says no, and there will be a lot of no's, you will be, you'll be like, all right, forget it, you know. And a crusader doesn't forget it. A crusader goes, you know, that's why Spike Lee adopted Malcolm X's mantra, you know, for his production company, by any means necessary. You know, it's like that, that's sort of like whatever it takes is really the, the key ingredient, you know. Um... And, you know, even in the case of Some Guy Who Kills People, even though John Landis was the executive producer, um, Ryan, who wrote, you know, wrote and produced that movie, you know, he went out and hustled money from friends and family. You know, that, that's where the budget came from. You know, that's where that budget came And it got made that way. Because as soon as John Landis moved down, moved from directing to producing, because he had to go do another movie, the financing that was going to come with John Landis went away. And so, because those, that was the collateral for those, those, those financiers. They were like, well, John Landis is the director of Atlas and the Blues Brothers. It'll probably make money. John Landis isn't directing it. He's only producing it. Ah, we don't want to put our money in. And all of a sudden, it was like, well, do we make the movie or not make the movie? And Ryan was like, no, let's, let's ask this dentist. Let's ask my uncle. Let's ask, you know, and let's cobble it together and make it for a pittance. And that's how we did it, you know. So, it's, uh... It's however you can cobble it together. And you made a charming movie. Thank you. Yeah, no, no I, I really, I really enjoyed this movie. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the, uh, a little bit of the, about the difficulty originally with festivals? Yeah. And yeah. and and what happened that way, and ultimately, you got distribution. And, yeah. and and if they can see it, where is, is it online anywhere still? Or, or it's everywhere. You can get it on Netflix. You can get it on Amazon Instant. You can get it on iTunes. Um, yeah, no, Some Guy Who Kills People is totally out there. Um, yeah, no, but the festival thing is important because uh, I've never gotten into Sundance. Never. I've made a dozen movies. And, I'm, and definitely four or five of them are totally... Could have been in Sundance. Never got into Sundance. 
Um, and Sundance is that thing where, oh, i got to get into Sundance. Everybody's got to get into Sundance. And, um, Sundance, just like any other big festival, is very political with a very, you know, with an agenda. And again, who, what films they let in and, 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 and what films they select almost have very little to do with the quality of the films being submitted. They have everything to do with who's in them, who the festival has a relationship with, studio-wise or star-wise. Um, and so, anyway, in the case of some guy who kills people, we submit it to all the festivals. No, 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 no. Um, and then what happened was is that we decided, well, you know what, maybe we shouldn't be aiming for art house or art film festivals. Maybe we should look at festivals that uh, champion and support the genre that the movie is in, which is essentially the horror genre. So it turns out there's a whole sub, not sub realm, but there's a whole world of film festivals. Some are quite huge, actually, that are all about the horror, fantasy, and science fiction genre. And we submitted to some of them, and it's, and and somebody accepted it. And as soon as it played at that festival and started to get some buzz, all the other festivals that that showed these kind of films started to call and invite us. And with, before we knew it, we were playing at like. 50, we did like 50 international film festivals, and, and some of the biggest ones in the world. And uh, and that's where it got a lot of it, of it, its exposure, but it was so, sort of like, we discovered that instead of the prestige of Sundance and the like, why not go for the audience that is going to be receptive to this kind of movie? And it ended up being a, a, a big movie in that world. And that's ultimately what helped to get uh, distribution to Anchor Bay. Um, but it's, uh, again, the festival thing is like, you talk about Las Vegas, it's a, it's a gamble, you know, it's, it's and, and it's a business, you know, festivals pay, charge you to submit, right? So it's in their interest to get as many people as they can to pay that in, in, in fee. You now, know? did it change when you're invited or were you invited yeah. to pay? No, when you're invited, they when you're invited, they see that your film being in their festival will make them money. So they go, okay, you don't need to pay the hundred fifty dollar thing. That we necessarily fly you out or anything like that. But that's the wash. That's the trade. Is that if you're invited, no, you don't have to pay the the entrance fee. Um, but again, it's like it, it, it it's. It's a business. The film festival thing is a business, and it doesn't. And it's it's good for your ego. Although, you know, personally, I didn't attend, even though this was the film that got into the most film festivals I've ever had been in, I didn't really go to many of them except the ones that were local because I couldn't afford to pay $5,000 to fly to France and, put, and stay in a hotel or in Spain just to have my ego stroked um, uh, because they weren't paying for that. So uh, I didn't attend a lot of them simply because I couldn't afford it. Um, but I went to the ones in LA and New York, and, and those were fun, and it's good. It's, I mean, festivals are fun, particularly if you win. Uh, it's good for the ego. But um, yeah, I think that the advice is to think about the movie that you're, the genre or the style of the movie that you're making, and, and target those festivals that 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 um, play those types of movies that that are about those types of movies. Excellent. Any questions? Yes. Oh, my name is Spencer. Um, you ever had any actors like fail like halfway through production? Halfway through production? Or like um, part way through? Or like... Well, I mean, actors actors have fallen out. You know, um, I haven't been in a situation where where actors drop out in the middle of a production because unless somebody unless an actor gets sick or injured or something like that, then they're obliged to. Because they're contracted in union. Yeah, they have to finish the movie. I mean, there have been situations like in in uh, there have been situations in movies where actors have, um, you know, like for example, some uh, one of the movies that I I made had an obligatory nude scene. You know, that was in their contract, and uh, and when it came time to do that nude scene, the actress balked. You know, she didn't want to. She didn't want to do it. She, she was nervous, or she, she maybe had no intention of doing it. And we had shot half the movie already. And, and in a way, she had the production over a barrel because she couldn't, we couldn't reshoot the whole movie. And 
anyway, so so there have been situations where those kind of things can happen, but um, uh, no, I haven't had that particular experience. How did you resolve that? Did you body double? Did she finally do it? Did she body double? And then did you have to have her sign off on the body double? Uh, I think so. I think that was really, that was more like a producer's negotiation. Yeah. I was just sort of like, how the hell now am I going to shoot this to make it work? Um, but yeah, I think that's how it was resolved. Cool. Right. Did, that, um, anyone else? Just so you know, we got about 12 or 15 minutes at the outside, Then and, sure. and I'm really enjoying this, Jack. Sure. Yes, Stephen? I was wondering, what was it like working with large crews at once? What keeps your emotions positive when under pressure with that that many people to direct so you can stay focused on the shots? Yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because the crews, the crews do get bigger with, with the, the bigger budgets. I mean, that's one of the things that uh, you notice when you work on a, on a bigger movie is that every it's a bigger army, right? But um, and but truthfully, as a result of that, the more people that you have, it's like moving. It's moving a large army. It takes longer to move that army. That's why it's funny. People used to say they used to go on Stanley Cooper sets, and they were always surprised at how few people were actually on the set because he knew that there were only, you know, a few key people that were needed to actually make the movie. And the truth is, is that it's, there's no difference between very little difference between when you're making your short films and on a studio level, because it really just boils down to the director, the actor, the cinematographer, and the sound man. I mean, it, with, you know, that's as bluntly as you can put it, that's, that's the moment that you're making right there, right? And so um, I don't think I was ever um, intimidated by the large numbers of people because I was always very focused on the the scene and the actor and the moment right in front of me. So I think it's a matter of just, if you, if that, you know, like just basically uh, zeroing in on, on what you're supposed to do as a director, which is direct the actor and the cinematographer and forget everybody else. Just like an actor has to forget all those people standing right in front of them. You know, I think you just have to sort of zero in on what you're, on the moment, which is what your job is as a director, you know, is to get that moment. And, and actually, when you think about it again, it's like there are very few people you need to talk to. You're going to talk to your actor. You're going to talk to your photographer about how you're going to change the shot. And that's it. You know, that's essentially it. Unless a problem arises, you have to consult with your producer. But ultimately, that's, that's all it is. It's you, the actor, and the, and the cinematographer. Everybody else is in support. Um, I want to ask a question because I have spent, since I've been in the Midwest, I've spent more time on on less professional sets yeah. with student filmmakers or emerging filmmakers or non-union filmmakers and things like that, either consulting or working or, or in some cases acting in, in SAG productions. And but the question is, is um, a lot of the emerging filmmakers seem to be enamored with the shot and the technology, the composition over and above performance. Yeah. So they don't, and, and I what do you think about this? Because I have a. Yeah, no, I, mean, I mean, I think it's just a matter of I think it's just a matter of experience and age. I think that we all, and myself included, uh, concentrate on the technical aspects of filmmaking in the beginning because those are the ones that are mathematical. You can pick a lens, you can orchestrate a camera move, you can create this effect. It's a technical exercise that you are in control of, and the reason why, in large part, we do we are directors and filmmakers is we want to create this world, right? The performance uh, tends to be this elusive, um, mysterious uh, thing. Like, how do you get a performance? How do you mold a performance? How do you guide an actor? And in the beginning, unless you've had training in theater or acting experience yourself, that is going to be the most mysterious and scary part of directing. And I know it was for me. Um, but as the years have gone by and I've gotten uh, made more movies, it, it becomes clear right away that the performance is everything, and that the performance is what's front and center, even in a genre movie, even in an effects movie, especially in an effects movie. Um, the performance is the thing that, that, that brings the audience into the movie and makes them care, right? And so if you don't have a way to communicate with your actor to get them to understand what you are going for, uh, if you don't delve into character and, and understand as a director 
what does this character want moment by moment in the scene? And really, this is the key thing. This is what I teach, you know, when I'm teaching blocking. Uh, and it's an, act, it's an acting thing, which is, you know, Rex, which is essentially everything is based on what a character's objective or what they want. How close they get to somebody, whether they back away from somebody, whether they're forceful in their talking, whether they're demure, is all based on what they want in the moment. So understanding the character as a real person uh, will, and empathizing with that character will enable you to guide the actor. So in a way, a director needs to be an actor, uh, think like an actor, to be able to direct an actor. And, and the other thing I think is super important is just to get to know the actor before you shoot. Now, you don't even need to talk about the movie. Just go <clears throat> and have coffee and hang out with the actors and get to know them as people so that when you're on the set, it's not this director-actor dynamic where I'm judging you and I better do a good job. It's two people that um, know each other and feel comfortable, and it's, just a, it's a working relationship rather than a judge and be judged kind of thing, which is what a director is doing. It's either good or it's either cut or good or cut, no, do it again. So you want to... You want to make it the actors super comfortable so that they open up and do the thing that you want them to do. It's not about you acting for them. It's about you being the most understanding uh, friend that, as you can possibly be so that they can do their thing. So yes, I, I believe that there's more attention placed on technical, but ultimately it's second to performance. And, and funny enough, all the best technical decisions I've made uh, emerge once I have an understanding of the, uh, the, the characters and once the blocking looks realistic. In other words, like if you can set up a scene and look at it like a play, like basically from a master shot perspective, you can watch the scene, like say a three-page scene, unfold, and it looks real, and it looks interesting from the most boring, objective vantage point then you know that you've built the scene blocking-wise on a very sound foundation. Then you can go in and find all the shots that complement the moments. If that's, a better, that's a better way, that's, a, that's the inside-out way of building a scene visually as opposed to outside-in, which is, I've got a shot, i got this cool shot, now I'm going to make the actor fit into that shot. In a way, it's, I find it's the other way around, is to make the thing work like a play with no, with no um, cinematic component at all, and then bring the cinematic component to the scene, and I think you'll find you'll have a much more realistic, uh, believable scene. Uh, that's just my approach, but I didn't start that way. I started the other way. I, mean, I got a shot, now I'm gonna make you stand where I have this shot. You know, and sometimes it works. I mean, it's not a hard and fast rule, but, but my philosophy has changed uh, over the years. Wow, very cool. Really, I really, I really appreciate that. Um, we have just a, a few moments left, and I want to ask a question, and uh, and then let you have the final word in 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 saying, you know, to these guys who are and gals who are uh, sophomore, juniors, and and seniors and filmmakers, um, you know, what they might do to advance their career from college on. But but my question is is. Can you make a movie for seven thousand today? I think so. I think you can make a movie for less. Um, I, I don't think there's any. I mean, look. I mean, so can you make a movie for twenty dollars? I, I don't know. Uh, can you make a movie for seven thousand dollars a feature film? I think you can. I think you can because I think that that you you know it's for all the reasons everybody already knows. I mean, you don't have to go to a. You don't have to rent an avid to cut your movie. You don't have to color correct on a Da Vinci. You don't have to. You certainly can own, you know, a DSLR and you can do it. You can have, I think that the technology is there, it's cheap enough, and I think that the, uh, and in fact, I need to tell this to myself, because when I start to complain about, well, you know, I need this amount of money to do this movie, and my wife is all, it's like, you know, you could be shooting this piecemeal, you could be shooting this bit by bit with your friends and not wait for the million dollars, because this next movie I want to make, I need a million dollars. I mean, that's how I would make it. I need a million dollars to make this particular movie because, and that's the cheap part of it. It really should be made for $10 million, but I can make it for a million dollars. But a million dollars doesn't grow on trees, and I'm gonna, you know, at a certain point I'm gonna have to decide, well, do I keep looking for the million dollars, or do I just go ahead and make it like you guys would make it? And I think that the, the idea is stronger than the technology. 
In other words, even if you don't have a technocrane or even if you don't have a steady cam, the idea of the shot, the idea of what you're doing can be mostly achieved using very inexpensive technology. That just happens now to be, you know, broadcast worthy and 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 hold up on a giant screen. So you're it's you you we're all in a great place. I think the biggest thing is overcoming the fear of doing it. It's an emotional thing. It has more to do with all right, am I going to roll the dice for myself personally and put my ass on the line and make the fucking thing? Or is it easier for me to just sort of uh, stall until I work my courage up? I think it has less to do with being uh, limited by the, by the budget or the technology. It's more about just the artist thinking that he's going to fuck it up kind of thing, which I know personally. I still think that. Well, uh, you know, I mean, but I mean, there's so many great examples. If somebody tomorrow said, I've got $5,000, I'll pay you $5,000 to write a script and direct a movie, take it if you can. If somebody said, I got $7,000 and I want to star in it and I want you to direct it, but you're not going to get paid, but you, you're going to make your first feature film, I go, take it. You know, I mean, there, there, those opportunities you can still find today and the technology is, you know, is such that yeah. you can do it. Even easier than you could have done it in the 90s. Absolutely. And do yourself a favor. And again, this is not like, I know I'm preaching to the converted, but design them. Design a movie that can be made for two or three or seven thousand dollars. You know what I mean? Don't don't write Raiders of the Lost Ark for seven thousand right. dollars. But do a do a contained. It doesn't all have to happen in a warehouse, but it, it, it can take place in a in, in 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 locations that you can control that you can afford. Um, there are plenty of you know you can make a thriller that you can do in locations that you have a control over. If you know somebody who has a restaurant or a bar that'll give you, you know, design a movie to be made within the parameters that within the parameters that you have, as opposed to creating something outside of your of, of your own financial possibility. Um, I think that's the way to do it. And and uh, and I have done that over the years. When we did the big empty, it was like we knew we could probably get hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Now what kind of movie can we make fully for $150,000 where it won't feel like we pulled punches and it feels cheap. What can we do? It ended up being a character-driven, atmospheric, private eye thriller. That's what we landed. It could have been any, but that's what we, we knew we could make that kind of movie fully for that kind of money. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I think you take whatever, you take it. You know, you take it. Short of endangering you, you take, you, you take any opportunity that, that, you, that comes up. Fair I it. still do, you know. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, we are at that point where we got to say goodbye because I have to shut this off and it has to process before I have to leave the classroom. You know, so that's the technical side of it. But you've been fantastic. I'll call you from the car in about a half an hour or something like that, and just if, if you're available and I'll and debrief with you. Um, but thank you. Any final comment or, or quick question that... I'll ask the last one, because this has been asked a number of times. You have to move to Hollywood to do any of this? No. No, I don't think you have to. In fact, I actually encourage people, if they're going to make a first movie, to not make it in Hollywood, because I think it's, you have an easier time making it than trying to like stay alive in a town that is, that is ruthless. So it's better to come, I think it's better to come to Hollywood with something whether it's a script or a feature film that you made, than to try to get one off the ground there. I, you know, I, my advice is don't, don't worry about it. To try to get your first work done where you feel most comfortable and where you have the most support. You know, that, that seems to be the best. So no. And, 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 and in truth, you don't ever, you know, necessarily ever have to go to Hollywood. It's whether or not you want to be in that work. But as an independent filmmaker, you could stay wherever you wanted if you could find the money. Um, and I've often thought about that, you know, um, but no, no, you don't have to. That's awesome. That's awesome. Jack, I appreciate it so much. Thank you kindly for being with us today. This ultimately will end up on YouTube, uh, and, uh, and I'll let you know when that happens, but, uh, have a great, fabulous day. Enjoy San Francisco. When do you get back home? Uh, I come back on Thursday, so I'm home soon. All right. Uh, but it's, uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Rex, as always. And nice meeting all you guys, and, uh, and good luck to you. All right. And I'll talk to you in a little bit. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. See you. You see you.